Hare Krishna Shamantru, welcome back. It's wonderful to have you here. Hare Krishna, thank you for having me. So I was thinking today we'll continue our past discussion on war with a specific and ghastly form that war has taken in today's world, at least in some way, that is terrorism. So firstly, if we want to differentiate between war, which has always been there throughout history, and terrorism, I could say that there are three main differences between at least the way war was fought according to Kshatriya codes. It is fought between warriors. Mm. It is fought when people are when the two warriors are equipped and they are alert. Like if you consider the Kurukshetra war, they plan. This is the place where we are going to meet. And you get your armies, you get our armies, and they fought at that place. And civilians were not hurt. On the other hand, terrorism means it is practically only civilians are targeted. And they are so the, the targets are unequipped, they are unalert, and they are non-combatants. So that is it's like systematic, intentional, brutal targeting of non-combatants, I would say. That is the defining characteristic of terrorism. So now, of course, the label can be used differently. Anybody who wants to give their opponents a bad name can call that you are terrorists. But I think this targeting of non-combatants uh, who are unalert and unequipped, that, that I would say is one defining characteristic of terrorism. Any thoughts of this? OK. So I have a question. If this is how Kshatriyas would engage in warfare, like the First World War and Second World War with multiple theatres of operations and multiple nationalities fighting. Do we have any uh, Vedic uh, example of having something like that? Like we have Asuras and Devas, huge theatre of war and uh, like multiple mystical weapons being used, but not in the sense of uh, many different types of many different nationalities fighting many different nationalities. So that's why the First World War was just called the Great War for so many years. After the Second World War, it was start, they started calling it the First World War mm. because of many regions which were involved in fighting. And the Second World War was distinctly a conflict which spread to almost all continents. That's a very good observation. Although multiple forces came on the Pandavas and the Kaurava side, okay, there were there were Rakshasas, there were Nagas, and there were various other species who came from on both sides. But it's in the theater of war was one. So yeah, although many powers were involved, but it was not a war fought at many different places. We have Ghatotkar, who is a technically a non-human. Yeah. But also participating on behalf of his father. Yeah, we have. Like that. In fact, there was a Rakshasa Alambush, who was on the part of the Kauravas. Alambush was supposed to be the brother of the Baka, the Bakasur whom Bhima killed. Okay. And so then in that sense, if you consider Ramayan, it's like a clear war between humans and Manavas and Dhanavas, humans and demons. But in the Mahabharat, the moral complexity becomes more because both sides there are humans who are fighting and both sides there are demons who are allies so it's the moral moral map is not that straightforward over there so the vanaras and the uh, rikshas the bear population that is not considered in the ramayana war no no they they considered but it's more that we don't consider those beings to be evil the, i'm talking about the moral boundaries of good and evil Demons, okay, from that point of view. Okay. Demons are generally considered to be evil. So, you know, there are surprise attacks, there are, say, guerrilla attacks or something like that, but that's more of a war strategy. And that's not considered to be necessarily, that's not terrorism. It's basically targeting uh, civilians and uh, unprepared civilians. So, in the Second World War, I don't... The Holocaust, I don't think the word terror is used for that. Terrorism, although it could be called technically as terrorism, it was targeting of civilians. But it was it is more like a 
generally my understanding is terrorism is something which is non state actors the sporadic attacks if a state itself is doing it it becomes more like a genocide rather than a simply terrorist attack so i think yeah. more the terms maybe we could focus on the analyzing the mentality and seeing what spiritual knowledge can offer to rectify that mentality whatever is possible so okay so so quickly to cover this uh, mahabharata has this word the uh, atatai and uh, there is a similar word in hindi or marathi but which is much more milder here an atatai is one one who gives poison one who attacks with weapons one who steals land then uh, one who sets fire to your house uh, tries to kidnap your wife uh, what else attacks with deadly weapons poison weapon land setting fire and uh, kidnapping your wife and uh, stealing your wealth yes so now this is also from the dharma shastra which uh, may not be as high as the upanishads or other samhitas but you are uh, in pursuance of the defense of all six of these you are allowed to kill the perpetrator so that is what arjuna's uh, logic is and uh, just a side note that all six of them were used on the pandavas and still he was saying that i would like to forgive them so that's like another uh, side of his personality so we have ashwatthama as uh, in our prior discussion you pointed out he didn't kill non combatants he killed combatants but when they were sleeping hmm so that uh, uh, mattam pramattam unmattam uh, suptam balam striyam jadam you should not attack those who are suptam those who are sleeping but he did that and then when he tried to kill uh, abhimanyu's son maharaj parikshit while he was on his mother's womb these are also uh, am i right to say that they are looked upon more as senseless acts of violence yeah i mean again this depends on how you use the word senseless because uh, from the perspective of the victims or observers it's senseless but uh, there could be generally at least the way terrorism happens in today's world i i sometimes differentiate between say like hot headed anger and cold blooded anger okay hot headed is where somebody just uh, gets a momentary rage and they attack someone but cold blooded means there is a there is a or there is a there is very cynical planning and the intelligence is used so the word used many times in legal terms is premeditated yes premeditated is a precise word okay so i think uh, terrorism generally is premeditated quite well premeditated if you consider suicide bombers they know what they are doing even other terrorist attacks now we could say that uh, because of uh, ideological indoctrination they they dehumanize other people that's possible but still they do know that they are killing they may not not understand the gravity of what they are doing to some extent but i think that is uh, that is very different from a sudden attack of rage so it's a uh, it makes a cold calculated sense to them what they are doing so now i would like to deconstruct this you want to elaborate something more so ashwatthama's killing i think you are trying to say that that comes closest to what we might call terrorism in today's world isn't it ashwatthama killing of the pandavas children yeah okay so now mm -hmm. what causes this if you want to look at it that way that basically there is anger 
that's clearly there in all violence but anger am i audible to you yes yes very much okay. now anger it can be regulated it can be unregulated and it can be we could say that degrees completely unregulated so in the mode of goodness when the fighting is there there is there is we could say significant adherence to kshatriya codes in the mode of passion there is lesser regulation but still there is some regulation in the mode of ignorance there is absolutely no regulation and then there is complete blinding so there is no limit to the extent a person may go hmm. and uh, at one level sometimes uh, it is very easy. in english the word is to otherify or to other to treat people who do horrendous crimes as almost like a different species this is a monster hmm? okay but that to to, to otherify or to otherize the person that doesn't really help much although they the a terrorist who say you know the worst forms of terrorism are where say people use children to kill children that means the suicide bombers are themselves like say maybe 13 14 15 16 years old and they they kill even children so what is normally considered to be a time of innocence is used to exhibit shocking malevolence so how does this happen so from our perspective we could say it's the mode of ignorance in ignorance there is the so one way i put it is that in goodness we have perception of material and spiritual reality both okay in passion we have perception only of material reality and in ignorance we have perception of only a fraction of material reality i think this is if you consider 1820 to 22 knowledge in the mode of goodness passion and ignorance you can broadly correlate with that yattu krishna vad ekasmin karye satyam ahetukam atatvartha vad alpam cha tat tamasa mudaharutam so only one fraction of a person ekasmin that is made into everything so we could say terrorists they reduce the victims of their violence to some particular dehumanized label say for example muslims may consider the victims of their terror to be infidels they don't deserve to live or i think the nazis they considered they used to call jews as like germs or some they used very derogatory word, dehumanize them isn't it call themselves the ubermensch the superior aryan race superior part of human race and others who were classified as untermensch subhumans so subhumans just don't have a right to exist oh, so give them that name and uh, at the same time the nazis the some of their militants i mean some of the army people that buckle red god got mit uns god is with us so really okay. yeah so although hitler had no particular affiliation towards anything to do with god but god was used so so throughout the history we have people using a particular form of extreme violence saying god is with us and as you rightly said objectify the victim saying that their lives don't matter and the most horrendous thing is if you somehow lose your life in this effort a bounty awaits you in the afterlife so i would like to add the angle of extreme unchecked greed to the anger which is already there okay so you are talking here about almost like other worldly greed yes it is so there is that normally we think of materialism as generally say materialism and worldly we think of these two as synonymous but they are not necessarily somebody can have other worldly aspirations that are still materialistic so so many years people are saying that those who are living in abject poverty and uh, so gross social inequality 
there is no way this person can compete and get even some of the so called comforts of life so mm-hmm. then the alternative was strap yourself with uh, explosives just go to some office or some marketplace blow yourself up strike terror in the hearts of as you rightly said infidels what happens the cause gets served uh the cause has its benefit and you get lot of benefits when you go into the afterlife so that's the win win and it's the yeah it's, now this theory is little bit change because some recent terrorist activities also involved people coming from very well to do backgrounds so 20th and 21st century terrorism is kind of a uh, i hate to say the word but like a working progress kind of situation <laughs> okay and pinpoint as uh, i think i told you in some in three or four websites which had uh, interviews with psychology professors and authors they said there is no particular definition for terrorism and we can't define who can become a terrorist and why yeah radicalization is a uh, is a puzzle and uh, you know there is uh, is before we go into this just one or two points and then we'll probe this i read about specifically about suicide bombers and it seems that after 1981 the number of suicide bombers have increased tremendously and what about what is significant about 1981 it seems in 1979 there was a change in the government in in the middle east and they started sponsoring terrorism sponsoring uh, extremism more and more so it was um, in iran and of course i don't want to go into specific historical analysis but 97% of the suicide bombers after 1981 who have been there have have been motivated by islamist ideologies so terrorism it has i think you were mentioning something about uh japanese pilots also would go on suicide missions but yeah, the kamikaze said, yeah in the in the world war 2 which meant uh, divine wind so the, there was a fear in the japanese military elite that uh, defeat is something armistice is something which can never accept we will fight to the last person but they don't want they didn't want to fight in the conventional way so therefore this is the way in which you just take a aeroplane a military plane fighter jet fill it up with explosives and try to get the engine room of the ship below so that was the instruction to the pilots try to get the engine room below so What if you ram it? your plane into the engine room the engine room explodes all the explosives in your plane explode the fighter jet is above isn't it okay so he's seeing the enemy ship whether a freighter or a uh, destroyer or a attack ship whatever below so rather than hitting it somewhere on the hull or on the end the middle part the engine room is where he should attack oh okay that's the point so you know now we could have two distinct things i would say we could have violence as a big circle hmm? violence is has always been there in human history and then there is warfare as one like a smaller circle within it and then violence could be normal ra- random murders crimes or whatever now within warfare there is one particular genre which is or not within there is another particular form of violence is suicide bombing so now suicide bombing in the context of wars i'm not sure whether we would call that as terrorism because it's just happening in yeah. the context of wars it is primarily done towards civilians so if we can focus our discussion on what happens what is the current prominent threat of terrorism and that is motivated by extremist ideologies so moving forward to your point now i would like to analyze this from a uh psychological perspective first and then we'll talk from a uh, so the religious perspective so at one level the leftist ideology 
is quite prom prominent in today's world. It says that people are basically social, people are products of their social, cult social culture. So if somebody has become a terrorist, that's because of their socioeconomic conditions, as you pointed out earlier. And uh, uh, so if the socioeconomic conditions would be better, then they would not want to be terrorists. They won't become terrorists. Just to give a small example, there was one terrorist, I think his name was Carlos. I'd read about him long ago. He was asked, why did you become a terrorist? Don't, are not afraid that you may go to hell? He said, I was born in one. That's terrible. So your first point is so relevant that if the socioeconomic things are so bad, that where is the question of me getting a worse deal? He's saying I was born in one. Yeah, that's terrible. So now we could say, if you want to look at causes of terrorism, socio socioeconomic causes could be one. But as you yourself pointed out, uh, okay, socioeconomic causes combined with uh, also uh, lack of uh, education is also considered to be something which can lead people to manipulation, to getting manipulated easily yeah. if they're not well educated. And that's one factor. As quite often, socioeconomic and educational factors are related. But there are, as you said, examples of people who were well educated also. In fact, uh, many of the people who from when the IS was, was formed, many of the recruits who came from Europe to join it, many of them were reasonably educated. So one aspect of it is that one appeal of ter terrorism is not so much the what we are specifically doing, but the cause for which we are doing. So people want some kind of meaning, adventure, thrill in their lives. And modern society often takes away this uh, sense of uh, cosmic meaning, sense of great adventure in real life. Yeah, true. So then people want to seek for it. In fact, currently with all the protests that are going on in America, there are many causes for it. But one cause is that when people, people go towards some kind of activism, when they feel that their life doesn't have any value and if they align that life with some higher cause, their life with some higher cause, then that gives them a sense of value. And then for once we get a sense of value, then we may be able to, once something gives us a sense of value, we may become ready to give up other things of value for us. Other things that are normally of great value to other people. So, so you're saying that uh, this particular new thing kind of monopolizes the person's life so much that if uh, like somebody watches movies or somebody has gadgets, somebody has friends going to parties, if these things are taken away, he still feels glad, he or she, that he got some kind of a much, much uh, bigger thing and then you can easily be radicalized for that. If that's what uh, you're yes, saying. Yes, exactly. Okay. So this, this can happen towards good causes also. Uh, say, for example, patriotism. I think uh, during the Indian independence struggle, there's a famous speech by Subhash Chandra Bose where he said, I can offer, I need, I, what I want you to offer is sweat, toil, and blood. Or all that I can offer you is. If you come to me, you will, you will get sweat, toil and blood, but through it, I'll give you freedom. You give me blood and I'll give you freedom. Yeah. So now that magnetized many people. I think you only told me many years ago that there was an American patriot who said that the biggest regret of my life is that I have only one lifetime to serve America. Oh, that person was just a school teacher, Nathan Hale. And oh. uh, he has... He's now immortalized in American history. Oh, so he was not a warrior or anything like that? No, you're just a school teacher. Oh, amazing. But okay. he refused to divulge uh, some secrets to the British, so they hanged him. Oh, okay. This was during the American War of Independence? Or the War of Independence. Oh, okay. 
So the point is that sometimes that wanting to belong to a higher cause, if somebody identifies with that, then they can give up lower things uh, or other other things which are ordinarily very important. But sometimes that higher cause might not be a higher cause. It might actually be a lower cause. So uh, say with respect to uh, with respect to Islamic ideology, the higher cause they believe is that they are going to help bring uh, uh, bring people to God or bring God's kingdom on the world or whatever they have their particular beliefs and they will go to God. So the idea that my life ha will get some cosmic meaning and some purpose that can captivate the mind so much that this indoctrination doesn't have to be uh, doesn't have to necessarily be religious. It can be by other causes also. And sometimes uh, that can blind a person's normal moral compass when they start acting. Any thoughts on this? Uh, I think I had shared this with you uh, evening in, in a discussion that uh, we see that I'm not this body or I'm willing to sacrifice this body is seen as a, a little bit of uh, more of goodness kind of thinking. So I had asked you, whatever might be the socio-economic situation, how come somebody, like even the Bhagavatam has a saying that everybody's body is dear to them, who would like to relinqu relinquish this body? So what makes a person who is not at all to be called spiritually evolved and suddenly he gets ready to sacrifice his life? So you had pointed out that it's certainly not spiritual maturity, it is more like one of the most uh, wretched forms of Tamoguna. It is far from Satwagun. Yes. It is that now, okay, two, three thoughts are coming in my mind. One point is that when, uh, normally when we are attached to something, one, one sense, of, sense of attachment is through through trying to protect the thing that we are attached to. But another way it can express, we can express our attachment is by exercising so much control on it so that others don't have control on it. Yeah. Say for example, now this is not always bad, uh, but in some cases, so if I have the idea that I have absolute autonomy over my body, then I have the power to end my life. And if I can end that life for a higher cause or what I think is to be a higher cause, then, then people get blinded to the, the pain or the horror that is normally associated with death. In a positive sense, well, the positive I would maybe need to put it in scare quotes if a, from today's moral perspective. There was there was the tradition of was it called Johar? Where, yes, by the Rajput princesses. Yeah, and you know it is not just among the Rajput princesses. I read that uh, even in Europe, there were sometimes you know there are different kinds of invaders also. If some invaders would be very known to be very barbaric, then then even the ladies there would go through that. They may not have a particular name for it, but they would consider death preferable to slavery and uh, uh, slavery and violation. Otherwise, so you know that is that is a different thing. One is want to protecting one's sanctity, but that if the, the idea of absolute autonomy means I have complete control over my body and I will do whatever I want with my body, including kill the body. And especially if there is a there is the idea that I'll be rewarded for this. Now this, uh, then it can, it can motivate a person to do things which normally they would not do. And this is something which uh, we could be a whole topic of discussion if we go into religious extremism. Now, one of the criticisms of atheists towards religion is that you know, the religious promise of a other life, of a other world, hmm, it inoculates people to the fears that would deter ordinary human beings. Correct. 
So now that can be positive. People can act with great courage, but it can also make people horrifyingly reckless. So most people would not become suicide bombers, but if somebody is is convinced that by dying in this cause, I'll become a suicide bomber, or so rather, I will attain jannat, I will have uh, heavenly joys, then that. They see that there is no loss at all for me. Or whatever losses there is, a much greater gain for me. So, so what I is again when I was asked this question, the way I try to answer it is that just having the idea of an other other world is not the essence of religion. The essence of religion is a spiritual conception of life. So. If we have the idea of other world with a materialistic conception, that will have disastrous results. That one one possible results can be disastrous. So, so without so we could again if I want to go to like four quadrants, you know we could have this worldly materialism, other worldly materialism, uh, this worldly spirituality, and other worldly spirituality. Should I draw this? I'm only drawing it here. <laughs> oh, okay, excellent. Okay. Mm. But I don't know how how much a handwritten thing you would be able to share. No, no, no. I'm just uh, so that it's easy for me to uh, reflect and uh, talk about it. So uh, I'm just quickly doing it here. So okay, can you see my screen? So yes. I have the world and nature of the, so world and reality. I'm just simply putting it straightforward. This is nature of okay. Let's put it material, and this is spiritual, and this is this worldly, and this is other world. Okay. So now if we have this, so we have only this world. There is this. There's only this world is what is real, and this world is material. So we could call this as straightforward materialism. Yeah. Hmm? Now, if somebody has a material conception, okay, let's keep this as as a has a material conception, but they have, uh, we have, they have idea of other world. So, okay, we could call this religious materialism. We yeah, could call using, it atheistic like using using religion for materialistic purposes. Yeah, so okay. this could be a religious materialism, or we could just put it atheistic materialism, or just materialism. Let's keep it like that for the time being. Then I don't know whether there is any philosophy like this. Yeah, yeah. That uh, spirituality. So we believe that reality is spiritual, but we consider this world only to be real. I don't know whether there's anything like this. There is yeah, a that is, uh, that, that should there is something easy. called panpsychism. Panpsychism is the idea that all of reality is conscious. So everything is in that sense spiritual, but we do, that's not relevant so much for our discussion. But this is so. This is we could say real spirituality, or we could say the Gita spirituality, or In the mainstream understanding of spirituality is this way: that um, so normally, if it's somebody in the first quadrant, so they would be afraid of giving their giving up, their, losing their life, yes. because this this life, this world's existence is all that is there. Hmm? Now, if somebody is in the a second quadrant, I don't think that's relevant for us. In the third quadrant. they have not changed their conception of life so that's why the description of heavenly pleasures that they will enjoy are also very materialistic they will have some virgins to enjoy with and they will have various worldly products to enjoy so that's religious materialism and then if you go to the fourth quadrant spirituality what we are talking about here is that we don't deny the reality of this world but the foundational reality is spiritual and the foundational world is the spiritual world and yeah. the way to going to the spiritual world is by a 
is actually by elevating one's consciousness to the spiritual level. It is not simple. So it's not that simply by dying in a war or some cause like that, one will automatically become elevated or liberated. One has to spiritualize one's consciousness. Hmm? And that requires a, a lifelong dedication to purifying, uh, purifying oneself. So which is very different from the kind of violence, indiscriminate violence, which is supposed to elevate people to have uh, heavens. So I think this is a, so it's, so th we could say this, these two quadrants primarily, if you understand the difference between them, then religious extremism is one, one possible result of this quadrant where we still have a materialistic conception, but extremism won't happen if we have a spiritual conception. Isn't it? Yeah. So basically, uh, only when you expand quadrant number four and the more it carries, more it captures the territory of the first three, okay. then a person can kind of be, uh, he can be de-radicalized in today's terms. Yeah. So de-radicalization has to, so now when we talk about the lack of meaning in people's lives, there are, there are healthy and unhealthy ways of bringing meaning to one's life. So, so somebody tries to get meaning by simply going to quadrant three, by some material religiosity, that could be unhealthy. But as you said, if they go to quadrant four, spiritual, spirituality, then the meaning that will come will be healthier. Now, another way of looking at this is, uh, that again, this is from a psychological perspective that uh, all of us, when uh, things don't go our way, we, we feel angry, we feel resentful. Now, depending on our conscience and our culture, we will, we will express that anger within particular limits. Okay. Say some people, when they get angry, uh, they might just not talk with anyone. Some people, when they get angry, they might just go on a rant and yell at others. Some people, not only will they go on a rant, but they will use obnoxious foul words. Mm -hmm. And then you could have like a spectrum going further. Some people might uh, uh, use some objects and hurl them at others. Some people might become physically abusive. Some people might take out knives. Some people might take out a gun. So we could say that it is also depending on one's conscience and one's culture, even when one gets, uh, gets that anger towards the others, how far one goes, that depends on one's culture and one's conscience. And uh, any thoughts on this before I move forward? No, no, you can carry, carry on. So, if one keeps, it's like if one keeps giving in to small expressions of anger, then gradually those expressions may become worse and worse. So, for example, in, in what we call a civilized world, most people will be horrified to, to actually wound or wound anyone intentionally. But there are, uh, there are mercenary killers, assassins, who may do it without blinking an eye. So similarly, with respect to even people who become terrorists, when, when the culture around them normalizes it, then gradually their conscience also becomes deadened. So the idea is that, the point, point which I'm driving toward is that, it is, there is a dark side within every one of us, like anger is there within all of us. Mm. But it is our culture and conscience that determines how far somebody goes in, in giving expression to that anger. And in the case of terrorism, there is practically no limit in that. So 
So, any thoughts on this? Mm? No, carry on. Okay. So, any thoughts? Have you covered? You? Have you covered all the psychological aspects? Because uh, that one thing which I read, four reasons or five reasons why young people become terrorists today, or why would they sign up? Almost uh, all of them had something to do with uh, they want an identity. They want an identity. They want to belong to something. They want to align with something bigger. They are bored with their life. I never thought this could be a uh, like a stimulant. That you are, there are people who are having so much of the so-called good things of material life that they are bored with that. And they want that thrill. They wanted excitement. They see that if we read the news and in these uh, particular spots of the world, there is so much happening. And they already have their video games. They are killing thousands of thousands of uh, virtual people every day. So then one day you feel like, why not do it in the real life? Yeah. But this is interesting that the sheer amount of violence that people enjoy in movies and other things, there, is, there, is, there are some debates about how much that translates into real life. But sometimes it can, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. So uh, now moving on to the solution part, you know, I had this thought that how much is say human nature reformable? And now we discussed about how people get radicalized. So now, can those who are radicalized be brought back? Can they be de-radicalized? So now the, we could say again, uh, the leftist view is that, I'm not using left in a derogatory sense, just objective sense is that people are products of their social situations, change the social situations and people will become better. Now it doesn't always happen like that. And in our tra spiritual traditions, we have at one side examples of people getting transformed. So Murugari, who was causing brutal violence to animals, becomes changed. But then we also have examples of people who don't get changed. So Ravana has to be, Ravana has to be punished with capital punishment. So is Duryodhana. So we have both kinds of examples that the nature which a person has acquired over a period of either previous lifetime or this lifetime also, that is sometimes changeable and that is sometimes not changeable. So what are your thoughts about spiritual wisdom, a spiritual perspective on the possibility of de-radicalization? Okay, so the, one of the most important articles which I visit every now and then is from the science of self-realization, finding the cure for today's social ills. Okay. And there is a interview, July 1975, with the Chicago Police Department Media Relations Lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant David Mosey. And uh, Prabhupada's main point is, like just in a nutshell, if human beings are not given the facility to learn about God, then they remain on the level of cats and dogs. You cannot have peace in a society of cats and dogs. The thief and murderer already know the law, yet they still commit violent crimes due to their unclean hearts. So our process is to cleanse the unclean heart. Uh, the process to cleanse the heart. So Prabhupada's simple uh, formula which he proclaimed everywhere that uh, we just have to uh, he's telling that police uh, lieutenant that uh, we should be given us we should be given facility for holding mass sankirtan and society will change so it is not just that uh, there is a theoretical understanding Prabhupada also made it practical and uh, so that that is our uh, how we do it and uh, like we have seen the united nations accepting some organizations and having like a prayer for everybody, meditation for everybody. So this is not completely a pipe dream. It is possible. And uh, that is something which I uh, 
find that Srila Prabhupada stressed on that. That's very interesting now. We have also had some success with our prison ministries. Correct. Where, where people who are criminals have been changed. Now, the first thought that came in my mind when you read that quote was that you know, Prabhupada, Prabhupada spoke this before the world had the threat of radical Islam where people use God to justify their brutality. Yeah. So in that sense, some, people, some atheists might say that you know, it is in the name of God they are doing it. But if you actually know God, not just uh, we have uh, almost like a self-serving conception of God. It's like a God who hates those whom I hate. Yeah. Hmm? Or a God whose enemies are those who are my enemies. So that is, a, that is not really God. But cleansing the heart is something which is, which is important. And uh, so we could say that if people are ready to or are, are receptive to resources that can, that can change their heart. Now, then they are, it's possible to reform them. It's possible to re-radicalize re them. But if, if they're not ready to do that, now in today's world, say Islamic terrorists, they may even chant Allah Akbar when they actually kill people. So it is not such a cleansing of the heart would mean more of going away from the materialistic conception of religion to a spiritual conception in terms yes. of our quadrant, isn't it? So that would be at a, so at a social level, the government has to, at one level, if somebody has become radicalized and the government has to do what it takes to protect. And it also has to maybe neutralize those who, have, who are indiscriminately violent. And then the government has to work at a socio-cultural level to socio-economic level to try to create alternative sources of uh, healthier sources of uh, socio socio-economic welfare as well as we could say psychological welfare by helping people find meaning in some gainful employment and other things. But beyond that, having some spiritual resources is also important. So I have no new points. Maybe you can conclude. Okay, yeah. So just uh, a quick summary then. I'll do that. So we discussed today about terrorism from a spiritual perspective or a, a terrorism causes and uh, solutions we try to discuss. So what makes people radicalized or what? how do we define terrorism? So it's difficult to define, but one thing if you look at the radical contrast between Kshatriya codes of violence, where is, is, a, is a warrior equipped and alert, whereas a civilian unequipped and unalert. So it is targeting of civilians is we could say what defines terrorism. And uh, what uh, we discussed from the scriptures, there is a lot of violence, but terrorism itself is, uh, or the violence that could be called as terrorism is exceptional. It is even when there were wars which involved many, many kingdoms, the theater of war was, was limited to the war field. Yeah. It didn't spread to many places and it did not definitely spread to the civilian world. And uh, Ashwatthama's killing is the, probably the closest example to terrorism. And uh, from the mode's perspective, when the anger is expressed in the mode of ignorance, it becomes indiscriminately destructive. Knowledge in the mode of ignorance means one pursues only material reality and only a fraction of material reality. And then we discussed about, some people say that, so, so from the 1980s onwards, the specifically scary and vivid or graphic form of terrorism in form of suicide bombers has increased and often associated with religious ideology. So then we talk about the four quadrants that while some atheists may argue that religion removes the natural deterrent of fear of death for some people, but it's not religion per se, it is a, a distorted materialistic conception of religion. So, or a materialistic conception of life, if one continues to have while practicing religion. Yeah. 
Yeah. So then we need to move from the fourth quadrant was that one has a conception of the other world, but one understands that one has to spiritualize one's consciousness to get to the other world. Not that hold on to a materialistic consciousness. And then from a psychological perspective, apart from the socio-economic or educational factors, if people don't have a sense of meaning in their lives, and then they might go towards some healthy causes, towards some unhealthy causes, which, which helps them get find some kind of meaning. And then how when somebody starts um, becoming, gives themselves to some cause, you know, then the dark side, the anger within us, by our conscience and our culture, there are some limits. But then those limits can be removed if people around us are doing the same thing and one also gets some kind of indoctrination which deadens one's conscience. And then people who would normally be considered ordinary can also become brutal, they can become like terrorists. And then toward the conclusion, discuss is human nature reformable? So are ter can terrorists be de-radicalized? He said, yes, as you said by quoted Prabhupada, that the heart is cleansed, which means that people's conception rises to a spiritual level, then it is possible. So we would need a multi-pronged approach that the violence has to be countered. The socio-economic and other factors causing the violence also need to be addressed and spiritual resources can be provided. Any concluding thoughts? No, that was nicely summarized. Thank you very much. Okay. Wonderful Thank talking. You.